everybody. Thank you for so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Savani Campos. At CTLN, we have this video interview segment called CTLN Opinion. Once a week, we interview a local Connecticut elected or appointed official. We discuss current events and questions the Latino community are curious to know. Today, we have Commissioner Thomas Saudi with us. Thank, thank you and uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm very well, Savani. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Let's get started. Um, you recently retired from the military. Thank you for your service. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your time in the military? Well, actually, I came off active duty recently. I'm still now reserving, uh, serving in the U.S. Army Reserve. I'm a judge advocate. I've been, uh, that's an Army attorney. I've been serving since I direct commissioned in in November of 2005. So for the past 15 years, serving as a judge advocate in a um, legal operations detachment um, in early part of my career, and then with a civil affairs battalion, uh, reserve battalion based out of Connecticut, and most recently an active duty at an arsenal in upstate New York for six months, and in early June returned back full time to my position here as Commissioner of Veterans Affairs in Connecticut. Well, welcome back to your full-time position. Thank you. And uh, what a time to come back in. Um, <laughs> uh, now, how did you get involved in the Department of Veteran Affairs? Well, prior to being here, I served uh, for 15 years as an assistant attorney general in Connecticut, working on consumer protection issues, uh, medical uh, malpractice, not malpractice, but um, uh, pharmaceutical and medical device issues and fraud within the community. Uh, by uh, companies and corporations, and also was a special assistant uh, prosecutor in Connecticut handling home improvement cases. At that same time, while I was in the Attorney General's office, I did join the U.S. Army Reserve. And those two um, you know, uh, careers work really in tandem with each other. I became very involved with the veterans community in Connecticut. Uh, and while on a temporary training mission, uh, at Fort Dix, New Jersey, I had the pleasure of working for the former commissioner here, who is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, Sean Conley. We met, we worked together very well, uh, uh, running a legal shop at Fort Dix, supporting a training operation. And then when he became commissioner, he brought me on as his general counsel. I worked under him as his general counsel in the Department of Veterans Affairs, as well as his chief of staff. And then when he stepped away from the position to seek other career opportunities, I was uh, privileged to be uh, appointed as acting commissioner and then subsequently confirmed as commissioner of Veterans Affairs and have been in the position since October of 2017. Oh, wow. And uh, what particular needs of Connecticut veterans, what are the particular needs of Confederate, excuse me, Connecticut veterans uh, compared to other states? Well, you know, the needs are very broad and they do reflect the needs of veterans across the United States. And mm -hmm. those needs also are very generational as well as conflict specific at times. What I mean by that is we have uh, aging veterans. Our World War II veterans are now all well into their 90s. Korean War veterans are in their 80s. Our Vietnam veterans, late 60s and early 70s. And then we now have a new generation of veterans from Afghanistan, Iraq, a multitude of other contingency uh, uh, operations around the globe. And those veterans range anywhere from, honestly, their early 20s right through into their 50s. So the main areas, particularly with our elderly veterans, those who are World War II, Korea, and then you know, in between Cold War veterans you know, who may have served in peacetime, but they still served on active duty, is the issue of skilled nursing and healthcare. Uh, so we work with the federal VA in Connecticut uh, to co-manage care, to provide long-term skilled nursing care here at our campus in Rocky Hill, and also to connect veterans with those healthcare providers in the community, and also ensure through our veteran service officers that our veterans, no matter what age, generation, or conflict they were involved in, peacetime or war, are enrolled in and receiving the benefits uh, and services that they've earned through their service. The other part is beyond the physical health issues, and it's, it's, it's a joint effort, is supporting mental health. You know, many, particularly those that have served what we call downrange in theater and combat operations or in highly stressful positions within the military, oftentimes do have or suffer from 
uh, PTSD, and it runs a spectrum, the level of intensity. And so we work with mental health providers, both state public ones, as well as private community-based providers in the federal VA to provide mental health services. Housing is another area. Here at the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs, we have residential housing, we have skilled nursing, and we have some family housing. We also work with community-based providers, veteran service organizations to locate and find housing for veterans in the community. And that also goes into finding and working on employment. Many state agencies, including our Connecticut Department of Labor uh, and federal agencies provide significant training and connecting of veterans with, with jobs that match the skill sets they developed and honed in the military. And we try to translate those military skill sets onto the civilian side. They may have different names of the job, but in, in the end, the skill sets developed on the military side work very well in application to civilian jobs. And these service personnel are trained. They know how to follow orders. They know how to read guides and instructions. They know how to do things safely. Uh, the final element really also is then cemetery and memorial services. Just as we care for veterans when they come home, we support them when they're on duty, when they come home. And then when they pass, we have a state veteran cemetery here in Connecticut, uh, in Middletown. But we also support veterans and work the um, headstone reimbursement and processing those burials and honor guards for whether they're being buried at our state veteran cemetery or in a community-based ecclesiastical or uh, private cemetery. So that, that's the gamut. Our veteran service officers represent them in getting programs and benefits. We provide and support the outreach and connection with healthcare and long-term nursing care, work at providing and connecting them with housing opportunities, uh, and job opportunities, and then also when they when they do pass, whether it's on service, when they're in service, or after they return home, provide them with memorial and burial services. That's that's quite a bit. And uh, with the pandemic going on, I'm sure it's limited um, outreach. How has how have you how has your office had to adjust to outreach um, and, and reaching? Right. Uh, yeah. You bring up a very good point. Uh, it has been a very non-traditional way now. Gone are the days when I would go to large events where we would present veterans with their wartime service medals, recognition pins for the service in Vietnam and other conflicts. We would have hundreds of people and we could, and, and I would speak about the programs that we have. We would hand out brochures and flyers and really connect that way. So now most of the connectivity is done as we're doing this online, uh, virtually through the internet. Uh, also blasting out emails to our points of contact in the community, to veteran service organizations and municipal veteran leaders to get the information out that the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs never closed. We were open for business through the pandemic. We remain open for business now. We have our admissions open for residential programs, for our skilled nursing programs, and for our family housing programs. We did temporarily suspend admissions to put into place COVID-19 mitigation protocols. And I wanna to touch on that a little bit. We do have a very rigorous program here at the Department of Veterans Affairs in our housing, uh, our residential, family housing, residential, and our healthcare uh, to do ongoing screening daily. Uh, we do point prevalence weekly testing of all of our staff. And we do, uh, right now we are doing monthly testing of all of our veteran residents and now all of our veteran patients. Since March, we have had a total of uh, six staff members test positive, which in the context of what has happened across the state and across the country, that is a very low number. Those staff members were very rapidly either put on uh, admin leave and we did contact tracing and there was no transmission um, to veteran patients uh, as we could tell, especially recently. We did have 25 total veteran patients and residents test positive. Of them, 22 recovered. We sadly lost three, two in our skilled nursing facility, one in residential. They did have underlying serious health conditions, uh, but were able to minimize the impact through rigorous COVID-19 mitigation protocols here. And our numbers, thankfully, are, uh, are very good compared with other areas across the state and nation when it comes, particularly those who are elderly and have serious underlying conditions. So we're maintaining that rigorous protocol here, keeping our veterans and our staff safe. Uh, and we are fully open for business and encourage those who are in need of programs and services, particularly housing, uh, uh, temporary residential placement or skilled nursing to reach out to our agency. 
Right, and along with the pandemic, there was also a storm. Um, how has the Veterans Services uh, campus and facility managed with that storm as well? Well, we did lose uh, all our power on campus, but thankfully we have generators on campus that powered most of the campus. We did receive some supplemental generator support from Eversource and our skilled nursing facility, residential, uh, and, and uh, the bulk of our campus were never without power for more than a few seconds. So we were not, we did not have to transfer anyone off campus or rely on mutual aid but for our state emergency operations and Eversource connecting us with a supplemental generator. We did have some damage on our campus, we're repairing that, but again, we've maintained regular operations through a dedicated staff that you know, responded to our standing up of our emergency operations center 24 hours before the storm so that we were ready for it. Right, and uh, you know, not every veteran knows how to, uh, well, every older person doesn't know how to use a computer. So uh, is there a, a plan to, to reach veterans that, that are kind of technically challenged considering yeah, these times? Absolutely. We are trying, you know, we're doing Zoom meetings, we're doing Teams meetings and email, but the phones are open. We are still doing, you know, standard U.S. mail uh, outreach mm -hmm. as well and processing applications for benefits and services. So what I like to put out actually is a direct number to my office, which is 860 Six one six three six eight four eight six zero six one six three six eight four. If anyone is having difficulty connecting with programs or services or through our website, to please call that number. If someone doesn't answer, leave a message, and your call will be returned. They can also just Google Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs or CTDVA. For the State Department of Veterans Affairs, we have an updated website, also with a mobile app on that, that can connect veterans immediately to programs and services, particularly those who are in crisis, either having a mental health crisis or physical health crisis, can connect them immediately to supportive programs and services. Of course, if someone is having a physical health crisis, 911 is the first number they should call, but we also want to connect them to long-term, ongoing, sustainable, uh, supportive services that we and the federal VA and community providers have. All right. Um, I think we're almost out of time. Um, everybody can keep up with, uh, with the Office of, with the Department of Veteran Affairs because you release a newsletter, correct? We've been, we push out every week an update uh, on our, both our programs and services, COVID-19 updates, and we will be doing more outreach uh, through email and through particularly Facebook. Uh, and our website. So we encourage people to friend us on Facebook, um, you know, Connecticut uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, Google us and follow our website and we put updates there. And finally, I uh, just wanted to do a shout out to the federal VA and director uh, Al Montoya, who is an excellent partner with us, who has done an amazing job in Connecticut with federal VA in Newington and West Haven. And final thing we have our stand down uh, normally, Stand Down is a physical event on a Rocky Hill campus, but we are now doing it online and uh, at some locations throughout the state of Connecticut on September 24th and 25th. That is a one-stop shopping, both online and at physical locations for personal need items for veterans and programs and service providers will also be online as well as available at some physical locations throughout the state. That is on our website. Great. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to get information out about our veterans. And I just want to thank all our veterans and service members for their service to our country. And thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak a little bit about the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Sadi. Thank you.